Hello everybody, it's your time again here. Welcome back to another Russian videos and today we are going to be reacting to the film theory. Uh, this one is called FNAF. I know how the movie through G ends, which is okay, quite interesting that MatPat has a theory about the movie, which I think some people do have a theory before, you know, like, you know, the, the little, like Mike's little brother might be the puppet, you know, which I quite believe them that's the that's where the second movie will go but i'm pretty curious to see if my has a new theory how the trilogy is going to end because i'm pretty sure it's gonna you know follow the the storyline from the game right unless they actually do more than a trilogy who knows um but yeah, is this like Matt Pat? I don't remember when is when is Matt Pat last video, guys. I don't think this is it, right? I think it was on Mars or April. I forgot, you know. So <laughs> you guys can remind me of the, about that, you know, because I think uh, Matt Pat is gonna be not necessarily necessarily leaving the the game theory channel or the film theory channel. You know, he's still gonna be around helping in the background, but he's not gonna be the host. And honestly, I'm gonna miss him to be honest, you know. So. Uh, yeah, so I think I, when Matt Pat is still here, we must react to the FNAF, uh, you know, related theory. Obviously, it is because that's what I've been doing. So without further uh, ado, so start the video, shall we? Hello, Internet. Oh, four more. Welcome Damn. to <laughs> Film Theory, the show that deserves its own semi-canon novelization. Friends, it feels True. like some sort of cruel joke. The Five Nights at Freddy's movie came and went from theaters. It was fun. It did great financially, and we all had ourselves a grand old time. We moved on, and now we wait patiently for the next installment to drop where Mike seeks help for a sleeping disorder, and Freddy <laughs> and friends take their fort-building business on the road to turn it into a major real estate venture. Everything oh, yeah. was in balance, <laughs> as it should be. And yet, they couldn't just leave well enough alone, could they? Because just just like clockwork for this franchise, they turn the movie into a book. A book! Oh, Even yeah. I announced they my final episodes, I still couldn't get out of this thing fast enough, could I? <laughs> Even though all the book releases were technically done for the franchise, after 22 solid books, and that's damn. not even including the graphic novels and all the other spin-off materials, so many Scotty books, man. Cawthon found a way to squeeze one more in on me before my foot was out the door. And you know what I did? I read the thing. And we gotta okay, say, congrats. I'm glad that I did. Because let me tell you, it <laughs> is a fierce gold mine. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today to tell you that the FNAF movie... Okay, this is actually way more interesting than i thought it would be i don't think he's gonna discuss the novel because i yeah i remember that it's gonna be a novelization of the movie i forgot about that but that's really cool the fnaf movie book oh. Oh, I can't even say it. It physically makes me ill to acknowledge that something like this exists. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I stand here today to tell you that the book version of the FNAF movie tells us everything about where the film spin-off series is headed to next. And perhaps okay. more importantly than anything, it tells Pretty us that the big reveal of Chapter 3 is going to be that Vanessa is a robot. Yeah, yeah, what? I know. I know. Are you, you kidding know, me? And throwing things angrily at your computer monitor. Mm -hmm. So when you're busy getting yeah. yourself an angry arm workout, what am I talking about exactly? Well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's not uncommon for films to get themselves what are known as movie novelizations. Basically mm. a book that retells the exact same story as a movie, but yep. because it's a book, there tend to be additional details thrown in to bulk things yeah, out. Yeah, more Insight material. Their characters, their thoughts, their motivations, more descriptions of scenes, things like that. <laughs> as you might imagine, novelizations like these were really popular before home video because people didn't have a way to relive the theater experience at their house. Mm. Nowadays, though, it's more of an additional source of found revenue for a movie. You already got yourself a script written after all, so you might as well throw in a few thousand extra words, slap a cover on it, probably just recycle some old promotional artwork, and boom! <laughs> you just made yourself a couple extra bucks from the hardcore fans and the collectors. So, of True. course, yeah. <laughs> when the FNAF movie got itself one, I was legally bound to read through it with the hope and expectation that there might be some juicy lore <laughs> hidden lore. inside of its pages. And let me tell you, I was not disappointed. It was like experiencing the movie through I'm some gonna sort miss of Matt, weird man. multiverse. Uh, Matt, For instance, <laughs> I am actually well, in the book, not gonna Ness, do any FNAF theory. The, movie. the catchphrase is in there and everything. Oh, it's really cool. I'm described as a quote, tall, lanky, auburn-haired teen. I appreciate that book. You know what they say, the camera adds 10 pounds, but the novelization removes 20 years. Oh, That's damn. It. On yeah. Of learning more That's a handsome man, right? <laughs> I didn't even know this as the guy who was playing the character. Ness is supposedly the son of the diner's owner, whose name is, in fact, Sparky. Sparky. And that right there, mm -hmm. that's a pretty interesting detail when you consider that there's a dog animatronic who we've all been yeah, assuming exactly. is Sparky <laughs> hidden in the back of Freddy's Pizzeria. It is a super unusual detail that gets just a little bit more explanation and a bit more insight, all thanks to the novel. So, I'm the son of a fake animatronic dog. File that one in my <laughs> character bio right alongside my undying <laughs> love for Doug the Lawyer. Or hmm. maybe not. You see, Doug in the books, he is a very different 
Catherine character. The diner scene straight up features him openly creeping on Maxine, enough so that she thinks of him as a total sleazeball. Let's just say that he's hungry for more than hmm. just the apps. Thankfully, this is one of the wow, precious okay. times that Scott Cawthon has stepped in to set the record straight, explaining that this gross version of my best shipmate is, in fact, non-canon, and that this scene will be altered okay. in all future printings of the novelization. <laughs> in short, Nug lives on. Or would you consider us Des? Anyway, you can already see how having yeah. more words on the page gives you tons of additional context to what you're seeing on the screen, and likely more insight into the original intent of these sorts of moments. And as you might imagine, if small bit players like Doug and I are getting lore drops from the books, then the main characters are also getting a lot of extra info in there as well. For instance, mm -hmm. in the movie, it was lightly implied that Maxine had a bit of a crush on Mike. I picked it up right here, where she subtly signals that she wants him to put a ring on it. I wish someone would have me a ring. It's not a big plot point, but you can tell that there's a bit more under the surface of this interaction. In the book, though, it goes from subtle subtext into a full-on plot point. She constantly oh, dresses man. up for Mike, dropping tons of hints about her interest, growing more and more frustrated with Mike as he's completely oblivious to her advances. In fact, it's actually part of her motivation for spying on him for Aunt Jane, which she also feels very regretful for in the books, unlike the film where she just kind of looks sad out of a window for a bit. Another huge detail about the main characters, Mike is more of a theorist in the book than he was in the film, actively taking on more of the responsibility for unraveling mm, the mystery. Okay. He independently does research. He even discovers the missing children's incident by himself instead of just being told about it by Vanessa later on. In That's already way better for the character because Mike in the movie just like didn't really do much, right? And Vanessa is just like, again, it's just like, uh, uh, like you know, like Vanessa basically just dumping the lore of FNAF on Mike, which I think might be easier from the movie perspective. But the, the fact that the book did this is like, man, the book is already way better than the movie, to be honest with you. Like I said, I particularly did not really, you know, love the movie. I think it was fine, you know, like, I don't know, like it's nothing special for me and it's kind of disappointing, but the book, like my pad mentioned here, this already make the, the Mike character, a, you know, way more interesting to follow in the film. I guess they just had to remove that part of the character from the film lest he get compared to the performances coming from other established theorists in the community. <laughs> okay, so that's obviously a bunch of random observations and details, adding a bit more texture to these characters that either got cut for time or glossed over in a more visual storytelling medium. But there is so much more packed into this book, enough so that I believe that we can figure out exactly where the story of the next two movies is headed. And okay. it all begins with the hill that apparently I'm going to be dying on for my final FNAF theories, a human being a robot. Don't hate the player. Uh. The game. Man. <laughs> Literally, I, I'm not the one making up the story here, friends. I just interpret the clues as best I can. But in this case, we don't have ourselves a robot boy. Instead, we have ourselves a robot cop, Vanessa. Uh. Vanessa is a robot, and I suspect she's not going to be the only one. Now, obviously, that is a huge claim to make, so let's start backing it up, shall we? Last time, we talked about how Film Afton seems to be much further along in his understanding of the possessed animatronics than either his game or book counterparts. For instance, he knows that they yeah, operate true. based off the pictures that are hung on the wall. What have you done? He knows that as he's dying. He needs to be wearing the golden body suit in order for his soul to survive by bonding to the metal. I always come back. He even seems to have a rudimentary understanding of Remnant based on the existence of that weird torture Freddy mask. I mean, seriously, these animatronics are not inventing a device like this. It has to be true. Yeah. Game. In fact, the novelized version of the movie's cold open suggests exactly this. If you read the prologue of the book very closely, you learn that Bob, the security guard whose death opens the film, had already figured out that he was nothing more than a lamb for the slaughter in this job. For First, his internal monologue acknowledges that he had been hired to guard the pizzeria. It's written expressly in sarcastic scare quotes there, showing that he knows very well that the job was never meant to be real. And as he's being dragged to his death by the animatronics, he passes by the kid's drawing of Afton holding the kid's hands. And we read that bile fills his throat in this moment. He knows that that picture, and the rabbit specifically, is the reason that he's currently fighting for his life. In short, the extra details in the prologue of the novelization strongly suggest that Afton is actively hiring guards to this pizzeria to harvest a remnant from them so he can continue on with his experiments and he's using his control over the animatronics to help make all of this happen and because of that despite this being an adaptation of one of the earliest FNAF stories Phil Mafton is likely already tinkering with much more advanced animatronic technology again look no further than the cold open of the novel the torture Freddy mm. mask isn't just an old repurposed Freddy head like it is in the movie instead it's described like this quote the two halves of the bare face peeled back like the wings of a beetle expanding outward 
as the fur parted, spitting robotic mechanisms filled Bob's vision. This description of how the mask operates, with pieces that split apart and fold out, is actually much more fitting of a different generation of animatronics. The fun time animatronics. Oh, and what do we okay. see in FNAF 5? The game where these fun mm. times take center stage? Down in Afton's bunker, we see articulating humanoid yep. robot heads, eyes constantly blinking. They're alive, and they're watching us. And these aren't just set decorations either. These heads are important enough to have been directly called out by the FNAF character encyclopedia. In the game prior, mm. FNAF 4, Afton's final line was, I will put, put you, you back, back together. together. And yep. in FNAF 5, we see exactly that. A bunker made by Afton full of robotic humanoids. A mad scientist of a man trying to use his robotic skills to bring a human back to life. To put his loved ones back together, literally. Going back to the movie, this is likely why we see a humanoid animatronic with teeth, silver eyes, and an arm with hmm. five articulated human fingers buried in the parts and services room. It's not just an easter egg put there from scraps laid around the Jim Henson office. This hmm. looks like it's a first generation robot person. So, we have an Afton that's already harvesting and experimenting with Remnant at the beginning of this film. And we know that there's a human shaped robot buried in the parts and services room that suggests that he might have been working on some sort of human prototype. That right there, though, is still a long way away from creating a convincing enough robot that it's able to fool yeah. literally everyone around it. And why then would it be Vanessa, of all people? Well, the first thing I'd like to talk I about mean, here is actually something that jumped out to me daughter? the first time I watched the movie. The performance mm -hmm. of Vanessa's actress, Elizabeth Lale. Something I noticed throughout the mm -hmm. movie was how aloof and disconnected Vanessa seemed. Her voice was always flat. Her character almost always stoic. The new security guard? Yeah. You're bleeding, by the way. You and Abby, you still mm -hmm. have each other. From where I said I'd say you're lucky. And for the times that she actually mm. did show emotion, she was flipping on a dime, seemingly out of nowhere. Take care of your sister. You can do whatever you want with your own life, but if you ever bring Abby back here again, I will shoot you. Considering the character that she's based on from the games, you'd think that she might- To be honest though, the novel seems like to give like a reason for Elizabeth Lale performance, you know, but I feel like people are criticizing her performance, which I think is quite valid because she is flat in the movie, you know? And I feel like the novel is just like, hey, here's, 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 might be the reason why she is flat. She's a robot the entire time. Oh my God. And the FNAF fan is going to be like, oh my God, guys, see, this is, this is, this is why it happens. It has a reason, you know, like, okay, cool. But as the movie itself, it's like, yeah, I mean, you could still criticize her performers. I'm just saying. It's not like bad, but still. Or energetic based on how she was in Security Breach. Hello, little <laughs> boy. If you're down here, say something. Hey, little man. Do you know what time it is? The doors are open. Why are you still here? And this isn't meant to be some sort of critique on Elizabeth Lale's performance or anything. Yeah, like no. That. We know that she's a talented actor. I mean, just check out some of the clips of her playing Anna in the show Once Upon a Time. He is Prince Charming, and you're Snow White. Oh, yeah, she's this Anna. I kind of forgot about that. Romantic. What is that amazing smell? I remember Frozen back in the day when it was super. No, the delivery from her has to have been an intentional popular. direction that she was given. Perhaps direction to sound a bit more robotic. In the novelization, mm. Vanessa seems to shift personalities on a dime, changing between what Mike describes as the bubbly girl mode and the intensely serious cop mode. For example, during their first night meeting, we get this, quote, Then someone invisible flipped a switch. Vanessa's cop mode deactivated. That right there? It's a pretty suspicious way of phrasing mm. a psychological change like that. Intentionally using robotic language in this franchise? Yeah, press X to doubt. The I same mean, thing yeah, happens true. towards the end of the movie, too, where after Vanessa's stabbed by Afton, Abby notices this, quote again, Vanessa's eyes looked weird, like they were lights that were having a hard time staying on. And speaking of both Vanessa's eyes and her personality shifts, the absolute biggest hmm. piece of evidence here, Vanessa's eyes literally change color when she shifts personalities. Oh, Check it out. Okay. Again from the book, page 144. Right after Mike tells Vanessa about his Garrett kidnapping dreams, quote, the narrowing of the eyes, the stiffening of her mouth, she was back in cop mode. No, Mike thought. It wasn't cop mode, it was something else. Vanessa's irises deepened noticeably in hue. They went from their usual soft, <laughs> almost grayish blue to a deeper indigo. The color shift was so pronounced that it almost looked computer generated. Computer generated, oh huh? God. What a choice of words that is. And yeah. indigo, you say, you mean the color that some would confuse with purple? But perhaps the <laughs> single most telling part of this little paragraph comes in the final line. It was enormously disquieting. Mike felt like he was watching a human turning into, and then he trails off, not having a chance to finish the thought. Turning into what, wow. Mike? Turning okay. into what? A <laughs> turning robot, into what? perhaps? And this thing with the eyes, it isn't just a one-off change. It is a consistent part of Vanessa's character descriptions throughout the entire novel. While explaining mm. how spring locks work. Quote, Vanessa's irises did the light blue to dark blue thing. Her eyes had turned an even deeper blue, navy blue now, almost black. As Vanessa's explaining her father's creations like the spring locks, again, the eyes get darker, sometimes purple and sometimes black. It's almost hmm. as if she's fallen back on some sort of Afton-designed programming, almost like he's controlling her. 
In fact, every time Vanessa tries to do something to keep Mike from looking into this mystery and uncovering Afton's secrets, her eyes go to this darker color. In the scene next to the storm drain where she tries to convince Mike not to try sleeping and dreaming of Freddy anymore, her eyes are dark blue. In the same scene, as Mike tries to get Vanessa to open up so he can get to know her better, he notices that her eyes grow darker and become blurred. And then something, in quotes, breaks any connection that they're forming. And yet, when she's begging for him not to go to Freddy's at all to save himself and Abby, again, quote, he looked into her eyes, so soft and blue right now that it seemed like some of her essence, life force, was leeching from her. If there's some Afton-driven programming controlling Vanessa, that would also explain one of the stranger moments from the film. After Mike is attacked by the animatronics and saved by Vanessa, she reveals the dark secrets of her past and the pizzeria. When Mike asks her to help save Abby, though, she declines. Not because she doesn't want to help, but because she feels like she literally can't. Come with me. If he's there, I... I won't be any use to you, believe me. And when she does show up to the pizzeria later on, once confronted by Afton, she's only able to bring herself to shoot once before completely freezing up, kind of like a computer that's crashed. Even my favorite line of the movie, You had one job, keep him in the dark, and kill him if he got too close. That's two jobs. Is a robotic, process-driven answer. And before you say that Vanessa can't be a robot hmm. because we see her get stabbed and have to go to the hospital, yeah, yeah, that's admittedly the biggest point against the theory. That said, remember the franchise that we're talking True. about here, friends? <laughs> These robots can be so lifelike, so realistic that you cannot tell them apart basically, from like, real humans Basically, it's like a they Terminator sleep, in a way, they right? Breathe. They can even bleed like Charlie mm. does in the original FNAF book trilogy. I get that the FNAF franchise tends to be cryptic, but time and time and time again, there have been signs that someone in this franchise is a robot. Maybe mm. it was Gregory from Security Breach. We know for a fact that Charlie from the book trilogy was, Jessica from Frailty, Billy from B7, Sarah from To Be Beautiful, the list goes on and on mm. and on. They are hitting us over the head time and again with these kids who become robots. If I just keep Which, to be honest, I don't really like the idea of them becoming robots. It's like, I don't know, it's getting too... What's so ridiculous, but I guess it's just not an interesting plot point, in my opinion. You know, I guess for Afton putting the kids back together, you know, putting his son back together, that was interesting, and you know? I was just, like, focus on that, but it seems like there's, like, so many robot kids, and now Vanessa in the movie is gonna be a robot. Okay, I think people's gonna... People are gonna be rolling their fucking eyes if that was turned out to be true, which I'm pretty sure it might be because it's an official novelization, but who knows, that might be a bit more interesting for Vanessa's character, but also not really, so I don't know. Saying that one of these characters is in fact an animatronic, eventually mm. I will be right. Right? Mm. Right. This would even yeah, make maybe. some strange imagery <laughs> from the games make more sense. Remember the unmasked ending from Security Breach? No, of course not. Why would you? Well, in it, we see two <laughs> I mean, kind of. One who's fallen to the ground and died, while another's still up on the roof of the building looking down at the scene. This was always weird, and we as a FNAF community just kind of politely ignored it. But it suddenly makes a lot more sense if Vanessa is in fact a robot. This is just two recreations of the same model. One became active the second the other one died. Which again, is mm. something that we see happening in the original novel novel trilogy with Charlie bots. But why? Sure, Afton might be creepy, and he's even creepier in the book, but why go through all of this trouble? Keep the pizzeria up and running, hire new guards to farm Remnant from, create an animatronic as human as Vanessa? Why is he doing it? Well, the answer seems to be staring us in the face throughout the movie. It's this. The Ella Springlock suit in the back. Think about hmm. it. Vanessa's incredibly cautious around this animatronic in the film, warning Mike not to go near it and going as far as threatening to shoot him if he brings Abby back to the pizzeria. If she loves all these animatronics so much, why is she so cautious about this one? Well, what if it already killed someone? Someone Vanessa knows very well. Someone like hmm. herself. Afton's daughter, the original Vanessa. Oh, I believe okay. that in his desire to create the best animatronics possible, Afton created this Ella Springlock animatronic, and it ended up killing his own daughter. Just like what we see happen with Baby in the game. Games. That is where oh, his obsession okay. that, started. All his right. desire to find that the secrets of life sense. after death. He wanted <laughs> to lot. rebuild his daughter. And in the process, he discovered Remnant, how to create it, the pain required for it. That's why he built the torture device with the green Freddy mask and made sure that it was close to the Ella animatronic in the parts and services room. Afton wanted to infuse the suit with Remnant, all in the hopes of bringing back his real Vanessa. Eventually, hmm. he was able to build the Vanessa that we see in the movie, but even then, she's difficult. She rebels. She doesn't want to help him as much, especially when children like Abby get involved. It's not his real Vanessa. And so Afton will keep trying and trying and trying. And if I'm right about this, it tells us a huge amount about where the franchise is headed in the next film. In our last theory, we suggested that Mike's brother Garrett is likely the identity of the puppet in the film, so it'll probably be the centerpiece of the second movie. I mean, the credits literally end with the puppet telling both Mike and the audience to come find me. 
However, this is going to be yep, a problem and for Mike and Vanessa. Even playing. See, Afton has a strange connection with Garrett. In the book, Garrett actually appears in the pizzeria during the final battle, luring Mike oh, to a more secluded wow, okay. area where Afton can ambush him. Afton has control over Garrett's spirit in the scene, enough so that Garrett literally melts into the shadows that Afton emerges from. Quote from the book, hmm. It was as if Garrett became part of the gloaming under the archway. He was there, and then he was something else. In Garrett's place, someone in a rabbit costume appeared. Not just someone, a man. So if Afton controls Garrett's spirit, it's likely that the puppet is going to be the villain of the second film, creating a hmm. whole new conflict for Mike to overcome. And then if the third movie follows the third game, an undead Afton will be back as the main antagonist, with the grand reveal that he's been able to make robot people the entire time. Vanessa will be revealed to be a robot, and Afton will tempt Mike with exactly what he wants. He could put Garrett back together as a robot kid, exactly the way hmm. Mike remembered him as a child, just as Afton did with his daughter. All Mike has to do is help Afton with his evil experiments. And Mike then will be left with a choice. Just how badly does he want his brother? Other back. Guess we'll have to watch the movie, and then read the corresponding eight book series released afterward to oh, find man. out. But hey, <laughs> even though Vanessa might be mechanical, there's one thing I know she'd be able to appreciate the sponsor of today's episode, Air Up. Okay, so I think yeah, this is just a sponsor in the end. Um but yeah, okay, you know what? That actually make the story a bit more interesting if the book was to be trusted, you know, like the idea of like maybe the real Vanessa died and she became a robot, but even then it's like I don't know man <laughs> like i feel like as a fanaf fan and yeah obviously you are already familiar with but i feel like the general audience is gonna be really confused and really just like rolling their eyes you know because like how ridiculous it was and granted the fanaf story was always been ridiculous but i feel like the biggest mistake that the movie did is taking the inspiration from the other finals of Freddy's game you know while in my opinion it should just focus on the first three games because the first three games are a classic it's a trilogy on its own it has a, a, a definitive ending technically in in uh in Final Fantasy 3 where the place burned down and even though yes spring trap survived becoming scrap trap right but I feel like if they just focus on the simple plot on Final Fantasy 1 2 3 then we get the classic feel of Final Fantasy Freddy's you know because so far I am not exactly a fan of like the, the you know kiss being a robot or like the remnants and all that kind of stuff like while it was explainable it's like okay it's getting really really ridiculous well in while in the first three games i can get behind the idea of like you know like a guy murder five kids and then the kids possess the anim the animatronics and then the animatronic mistaken the, the the security guard as the bad guy you know and it's like a simple enough story that i feel like it's enough to follow and i kind of wish that the movie trilogy really just like followed the first three games like you know took the element from the first three games and tried to apply that on the first movie in a way you know like kind of like teasing where the sequel is going to go instead of like this you know where it's like okay the novel seems to be like so desperately like hey guys like this is where the movie is gonna go if, if we you know if we trust you know mad pat theory here you know because i mean mad pat is uh i don't know sometimes his theory is correct sometimes it doesn't you know so it depends um if Vanessa is gonna be a robot, which I'm just like, okay, I mean, that kind of make uh, makes the, the movie story a bit more better than the first one, to be honest, because the first one is like, there is like, um, there is not much going on, to be honest, and when the sequel is coming out, I'm just excited to see where they're gonna take the uh, the, the character, you know, with, and then what kind of animatronic they're going to show in the FNAF 2. I personally cannot wait to see the toy animatronic built by Jim Henson Creature Shop along with the puppet, which I think the puppet might be become either the main villain or the main protagonist alongside Mike and Abby. Maybe maybe the puppet is going to help Mike and Abby like realize that hey, these are kids inside. I mean, they already know it was it was you know kids inside the suit, but maybe the puppet can give a reason for Mike to like hey like you need to keep fighting for this because we have to free these uh children you know inside this suit you know so they can be you know so they can rest in peace finally and then maybe after is gonna come back in the second movie instead of like saving him for the third one because matthew later said that he signed three contracts for universal for three movies so he's gonna appear in the second movie at some point either it's gonna be a flashback or it's gonna be him coming back which i don't think he's going to come back but potentially it's just gonna be a flashback you know one thing for sure he's gonna be in the movie because he he already you know have three contracts obviously um or like contract for three movies basically um but yeah still man i really wish that they just keep the story a bit more simple you know where it's like just kids inside of the, inside of the animatronic you know and not this like vanessa robot stuff like the novel seems to suggest which again we have no idea if they're going to include this element from the novel or not but is Final Fantasy Freddy's man they might 
they might include that element in the movie at some point. They might have to uh, tackle that story in a different way because it's a movie, not a novel. You know, so when you, you when you are making a movie, then obviously the way you tell your story is gonna be a bit more different. It's probably gonna be more easier to digest for the audience. You know, um, so we'll see if the novel is gonna be like correct. And it wasn't correct, but I guess like let's just see if the novel is going to like tease something big in the sequel. You know, which seems like that at this point because i think the way matt pat put this theory was so good that i almost i almost believe it to be honest but i guess we'll see what they're going to do in the movie but i still wish they're going to i still wish they keep the story simple and not including like the remnants the robot human and stuff like that like i don't think they need to do that they, they just need to focus on the first three games where it's just gonna be mike versus the animatronic and then eventually you tease springtrap and then eventually springtrap become the main villain in the third game and then to the, sorry the third movie and eventually you know what's gonna happen in the third movie where mike and abby free the the kids uh, soul from the animatronic you know so they can finally rest in peace and finally burn down afton you know it's a great trilogy you know from the game so i really wish they just keep the story simple from the trilogy because you are making a trilogy so i don't know man i, I feel like they're they are going a bit too a bit too big for, for the story if this was again if this was true but who knows right um either way that's my theory for uh i guess not, not my theory but i guess my reaction and uh, um and my thoughts for the film theory by matt pat you know um it's a pretty good one which i think i'm more inclined to believe that this might happen in the future you know um but yeah i i don't know like let me know in the comment section below guys you know what do you guys think about this theory right here you know do you guys believe it you know and what do you guys think about the now the the fact that vanessa might be a robot you know does that you know we like this is that you know weird for you guys or do you guys like okay like are you guys fine with that because i'm personally just like i don't think i don't think that's necessary in my opinion you know but that's just my opinion so let me know your opinion like do you guys actually fine with the idea of, of vanessa being a robot potentially and what do you guys think about my i guess thoughts on the movie should be just you know focusing on the first three games and only on the first three games you know like what do you guys think about that do you guys think that is uh, a correct way to do the movie trilogy or do you guys think that they did the right thing here where they actually took some element from the future fnaf games into the movie like yeah let me know all of that in the comment section below guys you know and um yeah if you guys want to watch the original uh, video then again the link will be in the des description below and make sure you guys check the film theory channel again the channel's link in the description below make sure you guys subscribe to matt patch you also support you know there is four film theory left so i'm gonna miss matt pat when he's you know no longer the host of the the game theory or the film theory and certainly i'm gonna be missing him you know making some fnaf theory obviously in the future so um yeah who knows um <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna miss Matt Pat, man. I really do. I think he's my childhood, like so many people are, you know. So, um, yeah, it's sad to see him, like, no longer being the host of the game theory. But at least, you know, at least he's still stuck around the channel and still happening in the background. So, I think that's good enough for me, you know. Um, at least he's not, like, completely leaving the channel, at least, you know. Um, but either way, guys, again, uh, if you guys enjoyed this uh, reaction video, then make sure you guys, you know, leave a like, comment, subscribe, share the videos, usual stuff, guys. And again, I uh, stay tuned for more videos in the future and again I hope you guys enjoyed this uh video and I will see you guys in the next one then bye